No. Okay. Uh, so this morning, uh, I'm uh, this. Uh, so this is the fourth of our seismology lectures, and the spirit of this lecture is to give some examples of using body waves in sort of this observational sense that I introduced last time to uh, study the inner earth in detail. So I thought I would uh, just kind of review really quickly that how most of seismology is, uh, is carried out in, in this observational body wave seismology is you have some, uh, some path in the planet and at the surface, we see some ground displacement at some given time and some amplitude, some frequency content. And because uh, there are enough recorders on the surface, earthquakes are then, locations are derived for these things, and you can figure out where paths have happened and where things have gone. But more often than not, we see an arrival that is perturbed in time and amplitude and frequency content. And this is where uh, we start having our fun. And so in this case, there's a uh, small gummy bear in the deep earth. You don't really know what it is or where it was. Uh, and this is, a, this is a big point that I, I wanted to start my lecture off with this, not to discredit everything I say subsequently, but we don't often know if you know some there's some shape with gradients uh, where it is, and that's why it's a big deal to have reference uh, seismic waves in 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 this business. And many cases we will uh, in will assume uh, some blob of constant properties, and this is kind of all we can do unless we have a lot of data. So. That's most of seismology. Uh, then the rest of it, uh, I mean, not all of it, falls into seeing extra bumps that you weren't expecting. So this can be uh, from some seismic reflection of some dynamical uh, interpretation uh, of interest, you know, scatters. All we know is that there is energy not predicted by standard uh, reference models with uh, you know, homogeneous layering. We, we're seeing extra arrivals. So as, as I go through today, uh, just keep in mind that these things are understood to varying degrees of confidence. And so I have a little report card I also thought I'd start off the day with. Uh, like what kind of things would uh, the seismologists uh, agree upon? OK, so the first thing is like, is there something in the raw or processed data? I, I give this a, uh, we call it fact. Uh, it's very easy to demonstrate that we see things in the data that are not predicted by these reference models, so there's something going on. When you uh, say, OK, uh, this thing happened right there where my coffee cup is, or right between my coffee cup and uh, my body, or distributed, this gets a little tougher. Uh, Unambiguous mapping of where an anomaly is, uh, is, is is a bit harder. If you have enough data, those red bars will go off to the right. And then the last bit is the anomaly strength. OK, I'm going to say my coffee cup is the anomaly. I've done some good work to show it's here because it's not there. That's usually how it goes. Now, the distribution of the p and or s velocity in that anomaly, around that anomaly, or the geometry, the precise geometry of this thing, the topography of all of these things that we don't, that we have trouble constraining, change the answer for the for our first order uh, picture. You know, so I'd say we we do quite poorly. Uh, it's sort of a more in the prayer category that we're getting it right. For sure, we could say something's right there. But its properties, and these things are really important. These relate to the, the mixing, the evolution of the system. So this, I want to keep that in mind, because we rarely adequately, adequately account for the 3D wave field uh, 
uh, in, in these imaging experiments. So today, uh, this is an old background picture. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly go through uh, D double prime discontinuities. It hasn't received a lot of attention at this meeting, but it's, uh, it's an exciting area of research that relates to lower mantle mineralogy as well as dynamics. And I'm going to spend most of my time on these large low shear velocity provinces because there are so many yellow stickies uh, with those. Uh, that, you can't really go there without talking about ultra low velocity zones, so I'll cover that. And then uh, I had a fourth up here, but I know I won't get to it, so I didn't even put any slides in it. But I wanted to talk about it. It's a fun area of research. It's a fun uh, seismic experiment to try to image the the outer core right beneath the CMB. So I invite anybody who's interested in that to tell me. And offline, we can go sit on a bench, and I'll tell you my story. Uh, OK, so I guess I'm probably making a mistake by not picking one of these topics and going in deep instead of picking a few and surveying them. And so I'm just going to apologize in advance that uh, I may not go as deep as, as you may like in any one of these. It's hard because there's so many aspects right now in the actual imaging work as well as uh, the implications and the multidisciplinary aspect of these fields. So, okay, so D double prime discontinuity. Uh, traditionally, these things have been studied uh, beneath areas where there's subduction. And some of that is because that's where we have uh, sources and receivers. We have uh, earthquake sources, uh, deep focus ones have been chosen because you avoid reflections off the surface. And we also, so these things often point to places where you have recorders. And beneath there, there's uh, been some evidence for a velocity increase. And, uh, you know, the, this is a cartoon anisotropy, which could, I'm not going to talk about anisotropy today. I'd like to, but no time. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, one of this method that our group and uh, more and more are employing is the concept of arrays, you know, a multitude of, of devices that let us uh, use these things in concert for something that we're, we're predicting or hunting for. Whether it's a fishing expedition, you don't know if anything's there, but you want to aim and hunt. Or ET, or you want, or you something is predicted to be there, and you want to image it, image the physics, uh, uh, the the impedance, contrast, and such. So we're looking for coherent signals that might let us beat down the noise in doing this. And the way that we do it, usually have a collection of sensors, and we define this thing called the slowness vector, which is uh, just basically a combination of the incoming angle. So wherever I see, you see the word slowness in my talk today, you can just swap it in your mind for incoming angle. And then the other piece of this is the back azimuth. That is, so, so it's coming from a unique direction up to the array. If you have this unique direction up to the array, then you could play uh, games with the actual time series at each station and sum them in concert or something coming along that azimuth. And so I'll show a couple examples here. So it, this is uh, some traces. They, uh, you might say, well, those look, really look like crap because there's nothing that sticks out. There's actually a signal in there. But I haven't yet time shifted these things for a predicted. These are six sensors in a seismic array. So I'm going to tell you where the thing of interest is. It actually happens to be there. Uh, that's the prediction of where that thing should be. So those things get shifted in a line, and then you sum them. Now, the summing part of these is really uh, a field of its own. There's a, you could just, these are just linearly summed here to get this arrival. You could sum these. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of science that goes into how you extract this information, whether or not you require coherency in these traces and such. And so uh, I won't talk about that today. Is 
Yeah, so the question is, I'm summing away the noise, meaning the noise, uh, the truck that's driving by is, is, is not there. Even if there is a truck driving by, let's say, uh, you know, all of the people in this room are sensors and I start jumping up and down. Uh, maybe you're interested in the ocean waves. You could take all of your recordings on your smart devices or whatever and you could shift them and sum them to effectively be pointed at the ocean. My jumping up and down will then be incoherent in that time shifting. So there is coherence. Noise can be coherent and in fact uh, it can be used to study the Earth's properties. Sometimes there are coherent things in here that uh, make difficult the thing you're looking for. The hope is that something pokes out. Uh, now, the, those of us who do this, we, we don't all the time, we're not always uh, getting very detailed about what these things are. We're just hoping the thing that we're looking for reveals itself in this process. Yes? So the question is, after stacking, the waveform will become broadened. Are you saying that because I may not have an accurate prediction? Yeah, yeah so you're absolutely right. Uh, often when you have these, and you can even do this synthetically and throw in some random noise and you sum it up, your waveform broadens. So the issue with that, I mean, that, that makes difficult saying something sensible about the frequency content of that wave because you've given it frequencies that may not have to do with the Earth but have to do with your summing procedure. You just hope that seeing this wave that you may have broadened is going to give you information about the Earth that you still could not have had. So the broadened wave might give you a slightly different arrival time. For some studies, this may affect you. Other studies, it won't. But you're right. Summing things can blur. Okay. Here, here's a, uh, another example. I'll show you the actual seismic array. This has been used a lot in the past uh, decade and before. The Waramunga array in Australia. This is one of five short period uh, arrays. This is, you know, 20 kilometers here, so the shape of an L, that were installed uh, by the United Kingdom as an effort to uh, detect and identify nuclear bomb tests. Well, these data now are all actually broadband instruments, and in you can get online and get these data. And this is for an earthquake up here, the Sumatra Trench, that I'm going to show you some information from. And this, this is, uh, I think this. These are uh, in the 90s when it was just a short period array. So each one of these sites, some kilometers apart, uh, has a recording with respect to time. So this is often what things look like. Now this, uh, so this is time. This is some 30 or 100 and something seconds. This is just a couple of, you know, tens of kilometers in, in distance. So you might say all of these things look alike kind of a mess. Yeah, you know, if you just gave me one of these things, I wouldn't know what to do with it. So it's a tight array. And so what we do is you could take these guys and then you could start to sum them along different, with different systematic shifting of each subsequent trace. And that's what's done here. And this, this is called a Vespagram. Uh, so here, s slowness is, is this axis. So uh, the larger numbers are uh, more horizontal paths. The uh, smaller numbers are steeper diving paths. So we're shifting all of these guys and sum them. That gives me one trace. I sum them as if energy came at me along this angle. That gives me one trace, another trace. So this is like an angle. Now you could see something interesting from this is that you have kind of a blob of information here at this kind of slowness. That's a shallower. And then you have some information here at a smaller slowness, so it's a, a, a deeper diving path. We often 
we'll do we'll plot it often like this where we'll just contour this up it's the same piece of information but uh, perhaps you could see the power a little more for this particular earthquake it turns out uh, at this slowness is for this distance we have our P wave so here's our array and we've summed everything as if it comes here and so that corresponds to the P wave energy this down here corresponds to the core reflection energy it's a steeper path in a PCP okay so this is uh, this is commonly done and uh, here uh, now these are S waves reflection off the core this is uh, these are aligned on the core reflection so these are four earthquakes each panel is a different earthquake and these are in uh, these are South American earthquakes recorded in California and so we're sampling beneath the Cocos plate so you see the core reflection pretty clearly you see the S wave very clearly and uh, there's a wiggle that appears to be in between them now I just drew this line here you might say well come on that's like, you know, someone could have slammed the door in the vault. Uh, it's, and so because of this, uh, this is when uh, Tina Thomas got involved with uh, Thorne Lay's uh, data and said, let's do a, uh, you know, the array processing uh, approach. And so I'm just going to show you this uh, vespagram for these data. And you end up seeing something like this. Again, this is the angle incident upon Southern California. And here's the S wave and its predicted slowness, the SCS wave. And there's a pretty clear evidence for something that is uh, in between these two, consistent with there being a reflector that's not the core mantle boundary, that's above the core mantle boundary. Yes, the, the data are filtered, and these data are only mildly filtered. Uh, you, how strongly you filter them will determine, these are actually processed a number of ways. The source has been deconvolved out of them to try to sharpen the pulses, because if I low pass filter these, which is often done to get rid of the high frequency noise, which plagues us, you will lose the information at these distances where these arrivals are quite close together. The information will be in the pulse, but it'll be less. Yeah. So these are these are filtered, and sometimes filtering can, uh, you know, there's there's some challenges with filtering, but it's in this case it's not not too bad. I mean, you could see things right in the data. Yes. The maximum scale of the ray, uh, it depends what you're going to do. I mean, you, if you're going to use uh, pure array methods that assume a plane wave approximation, because they're small aperture arrays, you have to not use a plane wave approximation. Like we use array processing for Earthscope's transportable array that goes from the border between US and Mexico to the border between US and Canada. That's a big scale. But you have to change things so it's not plane wave. And we often will define subarrays. It depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for something that's very small scale, you use a smaller scale array. Uh, or subarrays of stations in a large array. So it depends on your target. And the array still should not be located on nodal of the earthquake, right? Yeah, the array should not be located on the nodal plane of the earthquake. That's right. If it were, you wouldn't see any of these guys. These guys all depart at a similar array parameter, like I introduced last time. So, okay. So uh, when one does this kind of thing, you can, uh, yes. Okay. The question is, do you do this iteratively? Uh, it depends exactly what you what you mean. I'll just show you an example. Uh, <coughs> that study analyzed earthquake by earthquake by earthquake, and we imaged a reflector somewhere. And when you do that, you get these dots. 
diff oh, this is like a few hundred kilometers, maybe 400 kilometers. This is uh, maybe uh, 500 by 800 kilometers. So each dot is a reflection from a different earthquake, okay? And we're just spinning this thing around. So you might say, well, wait a minute. You're doing plain layered science to image something with that much topography. This green thing is just a sheet I fit to these points, right? So that in, this may, I don't know if this is the kind of iteration you're asking about. So then what we, are, what we did is like, OK, well, we can't do the plane wave approach with those Vespagrams. And said, then we did a migration where you back project the wave field to points. And then uh, doing that, it was, it was a better job at this sort of thing. Uh, so in some cases, you can't iterate. In some cases, the technology is not there. And I, I grabbed this, uh, these figures. Uh, Stephanie uh, was kind enough to give them to me, uh, which shows for P waves, uh, here's a P wave, here's the core reflection PCP, and a nice uh, something that comes at the slowness, that is the incoming angle in time, appropriate for a P wave reflector off D double prime. Her poster, you may or may not have seen it, also had this figure, which uh, is not uncommon uh, for us to see things that we aren't looking for. And so she, with Tine, are, you know, is starting to look at, well, what happens if this reflector is tilted? And uh, where does the energy go to? And so starting to uh, do this kind of stuff where you uh, are looking for reflections, but there's a lot of information in the wave field here. What of this stuff might be consistent with laterally varying uh, reflectors, which is it a phase boundary? Is it a chemical pile of something? You sort of have to sort this stuff out. So efforts are going towards uh, figuring these things out. Okay. Hmm. This is my anisotropy slide. That's it. I just want to make the point that there are, you know, dozens of studies that show the SV and SH wave field not arriving at our station at the same time that traverse the bottom of the mantle. And so these studies of shear structure reflectors at the base of the mantle. Where is that damn slide? There it is. Uh, these things, uh, you know, these very data, our reference phase is the thing that bounces off the core, SCS. It has traveled through an anisotropic medium, so it may not always be so simple. And so we may have some bias there. I'm not trying to be so honest that you don't believe anything we say, just that uh, our structures may be modulated a little bit by things that are not modeled in the same study. Studies trying to map out the D double prime discontinuity don't study anisotropy. Studies studying anisotropy ignore typically a laterally varying reflector. In some cases, it's hard to deal with these things in a wave propagation sense. These aren't simple codes. Questions about? Yes. hypotheses have you tested and presumably you make a power spectrum and what would you expect just from random coincidences versus your specific predictions and do you account for the trial factor when you um, report the probability of, of finding something at this location? Okay, so the question was, uh, what was the question? <laughs> The, you know, how, how exhaustive do we, we test the model space? This, this, it's an important uh, question that you raise. And I'd say it's variable depending on the researcher group. Sometimes we don't have very much data, but the data have something in them that you can't explain with simple reference models lacking something in there that's giving you new energy. And so, uh, lower mantle body wave seismologists have been able to publish their work by I see something and uh, it's 
its incoming angle is between the thing bouncing off the floor and the thing going straight to you and me, and so I'm going to explore my model space down here that gets the travel time right. And so decades of work have done just that. Your question's a good one. If you have enough data, then you can sort of just treat it like, okay, there's a cloud of something down there. I'm going to uh, grid search the medium for possibilities and maybe probabilistically say, okay, here's a, a likelihood of models, you know, attribute likelihood to them, but you have to kind of ad hoc say what's more likely than something else, you know, what's, and this is really tough. And we're doing this usually with 1D technologies to get my wave field to the point and back. So, uh, So when uh, uh, Barbara reminded me that I should uh, show you all of our dirty laundry, and uh, let me just go to this next slide. Uh, I'm gonna this low, large low shear velocity province. Things like this in the Earth, and nearly all tomography models. Uh, some people are trying to work their way around this. We we place low or high wave speeds in this case, reflectors in this case, from looking at a seismic wave field here and then using 1D tools to put things where they go in the Earth. And so we know there's some error because in fact uh, heterogeneity bends seismic waves. So. There are several groups, Barbara's is one of them, that are now saying, okay, stop using Snell's law and essentially optics and do real uh, 2D or 3D wave propagation, depending on your problem. Sometimes you can get away with 2D or axisymmetric uh, 2D, 2 plus D, or full 3D. If you could do full 3D, that's the best thing. Uh, so that you can look at the wave field effects of the very structure you are saying is in the planet. Our, our community has to go this way, and we're starting to. It's not easy because it's computationally uh, a bit challenging to do the whole Earth at the type of frequencies that we really want to go to. Many people are starting to do this. There's probably, you know, five or ten groups that are doing it that look at a lot of data. There's probably, uh, you know, dozens of groups who are addressing 3D wave propagation and maybe they're not data analyzing groups, but our community is going in this direction. So it's really important. Yes? I'm wondering what kind of anthropologies that we don't find. I mean, if it's radioactive, it's kind of So the question is, what kind of anisotropy is D-double and D-double double prime? I have uh, just a, we don't know, uh, is the answer. But uh, traditionally, the, the possibilities are it's, it's related to actual anisotropic crystals that are in some bulk sense, these crystals have some enough alignment so that a wave propagating through them will, will uh, see these uh, directional dependent velocity, so lattice preferred orientation. And the other, you can do this also with uh, fabric. Uh, so there is, uh, if you have waves that are longer wavelength than some kind of alternation of fabric, whether they're melt pockets or lamellae from sheared former morb, you know, crust, you, you can make up a lot of stories, and we have made up a lot of stories uh, doing this. You could end up with, uh, in this particular case, I'm, I'm, I'm making an example of the vertical direction having a different effective seismic wave speed from the horizontal direction. And then you can draw cartoons about how these might be. We have, uh, we've argued that these things, I mean, this is anisotropy is seen in a lot of places. 
we've argued that it's more complicated than this. And this, there's uh, the, the Bristol group, uh, Jim Kendall and uh, uh, James Wookie and co-workers, Eaton, those guys have, uh, and we've done a little bit of this, argued that it's more than just uh, transversely anisotropic, that you actually have full azimuthal anisotropy in D-double prime. Why, and the source of it, is open to interpretation. And that's because we don't have enough data. That's because we don't have enough data, and the volume of interest is quite far from us. And uh, actually, going back to this uh, slide, PowerPoint. Why do I use PowerPoint? What? I, I, th I think the software developers at Microsoft, when they make Microsoft Office for Mac, they have like do nothing do loops. I'm, conv I'm convinced of it. Okay, so the other challenge, the other challenge is even, even if we had perfect data coverage, like let's just say we have stations on every cl square kilometer of the planet in oceans, and we have events on every square, is we expect the source region to have all of the things going on and more to uh, give rise to anisotropy, whether it's crystallographic or some fabric-related anisotropy. There's been a lot of work that documents anisotropy near the site, you know, lithospheric anisotropy. And that work's not, you know, excellently constrained, let's just say. So you have, you have sources of anisotropy, you know, in boundary layers, source and receiver. So even with perfect coverage, you have to figure out who's who. So it's, but it's, I think it's, uh, you can, if we had more data, you can do much better. Any other questions before I switch gears? Yes. Now I'm going to ask, uh, tell me more about what drove you to choose this volume? And I know it's going to be a, a velocity contract. Okay, Bill's question, what chose me, what drove me to choose, you mean in what I t talked about, like under the, this one? Yeah. And if you chose a different velocity contrast, it would have a markedly different volume. Oh, I see what you're saying. What chose you, what drove you to wear pants instead of shorts today? I mean, there's some, there's artistic license. <laughs> And I didn't want to cover my whole volume with a red blob. I wanted some room to write on. I like seeing the core. The, uh, okay, I'm moving on to the LLSVP part of the talk. And I, let, let's talk about this, Bill. Because I want to know about the OIP volume. Okay, if that would be Bill wants to know about the, oh, you people watching the movie, Bill wants to know about the OIB volume. Okay. Are you referring to a source. Okay, we'll talk about this. Yes, Louise? Well, I think more, I'm curious about this too because basically we want to know if there's dynamical significance to that choice of contour surface. Yeah, right. She wants to know if there's dynamical significance. There is absolutely dynamical significance to the structures we're imaging. The choice, that image that I just had up there, I'm not going to show it anymore, <laughs> was, was, was chosen uh, actually before the evidence was entering my head for a chemically distinct LSVP. It was purely on personal bias of what I thought balanced reds and blues so that I could uh, make a point that, you know, there's some red stuff and some blue stuff. Because you, if, if you choose it too big, <laughs> And when Adam showed this stuff, he made this comment, and I, I don't know how many of you have isocontoured and struggled with this as well, that the top X hundred kilometers aren't shown, otherwise <laughs> you can't see through the window. And so same with there, if I made the contour level larger, then it would go up and you'd start seeing blobs all through the mantle. And I was trying to emphasize that there are low velocities in the lower part of the mantle. 
Now, here all the velocities are shown. These are, this is a, an older figure. I apologize for the references. Uh, they're not on here, and I forget what I published this in. But the, we're talking large, low shear velocity province. So again, I want a cautionary note is the P wave structures don't necessarily mimic the S wave structures in having this, oh, these are the max in the color scale. I, I was just trying to get the saturation similar for differently scaled uh, models. That you have this degree two uh, thing here, how you contour it. So this is okay, we can sort of see it. This is even a, an older model, but basically the those low velocities to first order underlie surface locations of hot spots. You can quibble about whose who's catalog you use. The red, so are been plausibly the uh, up motion in the whole mantle flow. The blues are uh, to first order beneath downwelling. And so that's been used for some time now to suggest that there is mass flux across the 660 and whole mantle flow. I showed this last time, so I won't dwell on it. But if you do spherical convection and you impose plate motions with the boundary condition and you start with a uniformly uh, contiguous layer uh, that, that, that's dense and chemically distinct, that stuff will pile up. And where it piles up mimics uh, where seismic tomography, that's the top panel that's just rotating the globe. Uh, has low velocities. And so I haven't forgotten your questions over here, and you guys hold me to it. I'm, here I'm showing stuff. Again, this is contoured. You could change the contours of this. You could change your initial volume of dense material on this side of the equation. If you started with a thicker layer, then these things are filling up, and before you know it, the whole core is filled up. But you still have the same topography. <coughs> So uh, this might relate to where we should be motivated to choose our contours, Luis. Here, this is again a D double prime slice, so low velocities, high velocities. This is the same model, but now taking the lateral gradient of this map. So just take a derivative in the horizontal direction of that map, you get this. So what you see here is the strongest change in tomography in D double prime is uh, surrounding these things. So that, uh, so the LLSVP margins have the highest rate of change of velocity. That's consistent with this being discontinuous, the red stuff being something that's different from the rest of the lower mantle. This doesn't prove it in any way, sir. They're little loops and things. Okay, uh, if you take the derivative, if you take the derivative of any uh, 2D or volumetric distribution, you get smaller wavelength things. And so, uh, this is not necessarily perfectly resolved. So anything where there's change gives you a signal in the derivative map. And so my gut reaction is I can't answer your question. I'm sorry? Locating the relative to his favorite spot on the surface. OK, yeah. yeah. Uh, I put hot spots on this map in a second so you can more uh, accurately orient yourself. I personally would say. In this kind of map, and now this is not justified, but I say the largest things are probably most robust. But typically, the southern hemisphere is less sampled than the northern hemisphere in global tomography. Uh, this is just one model. Uh, this, you, if you, in fact, if you do this for the different models, these more subtle details are very different. And even the larger things uh, differ. 
But to me, the take home message of this plot is if you do this Brainy model, the strongest lateral gradients are surround the large low sh shear velocity provinces. So even in the tomography, there's some information here that sort of supports this hypothesis that these things may be chemically distinct. So we want to do better. So the body wave folks have uh, looked at data kind of grazing. Now these gray areas of the LSBP grazing these structures. And in azimuthal sense, boom, uh, things that graze it end up having uh, broadened multipath waves. And uh, there's been uh, you know a dozen or so studies that have done this. And Okay, the, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. The, so, on what basis do I say that? If, uh, okay, the, there's, here's two contrasting models. One is an isochemical lower mantle that is convecting, and so you would have downwellings, and these downwellings would, uh, you know, return flow. The hottest rock on Earth in such a paradigm should be beneath the upwellings. We would expect smooth changes in the lower mantle uh, because the temperature should be s smoothly varying in such a, a model. Uh, so if you contrast that with something where I'm going to drop you know, some chemically distinct uh, pancake or something down there, now the material is going to hit this thing and go around it and come up. And so there's some details of the edges of these a chemically distinct thing that I'll show later that if you do have enough viscous coupling, you can really effectively heat this edge by your the heat flow from the core is, is quite efficient there. This thing is convecting with it. So you have the hottest rock on Earth at these margins as opposed to in the middle. And the plumes uh, are predicted to be at the margins if this is chemically distinct. And I'll show some geodynamics that. On the other hand, if it's isochemical, the plumes should be more in the middle. And so there's a couple of testable hypotheses. They're not like the nail in the coffin, but they're it, it all sort of, I think the confluence of the different bodies of evidence support chemically distinct. Yeah. So uh, I wasn't going to talk in great detail showing a lot of data, Barbara, but uh, these black lines here are where different studies uh, have argued that there is some discontinuity between background mantle and this large low shear velocity material. And uh, now underneath it, this is just one particular tomography model and then the lateral gradient. Different studies here underneath Africa, Southern Atlantic have come up with different results. The dashed line, this is travel time only information. The solid lines are waveform information where evidence for something broadening and multi-pathing waves is in there that you can't do with smoothly varying structure. To me, it's remarkable that uh, you could spend a lot of time and money and effort studying detailed seismic waves and you can get these things and, and in the end it, it looks like the gradient in a tomography map that is done with global data. These things being together uh, to first order. Now, uh, 
you could say, well, what about these details? There are a lot of, there are a lot of details here. But to first order, there are these so-called edges for the large low shear velocity problem. This is a, there's a pile of studies with different kinds of seismic waves, no tests here today uh, for these different regions. And furthermore, uh, if you now take that geodynamic model I showed that has a surface boundary condition of plates uh, pushing stuff around, and here I show the temperatures at the base of the mantle of that geodynamics calculation. This kind of relates to the critical test. You have the hottest temperatures along the margins. I don't expect this geodynamics models with a lot of assumptions to look exactly like tomography, but it, uh, it's, it just emphasizes that this stuff that is in this first order uh, seismology uh, view of the deep mantle is consistent with something chemically distinct. And what depth, what depth is that? This? Oh, it's like uh, in the bottom 50 or 100 kilometers or something. Uh, we, no, the geodynamics model is not average. We just took it at, uh, in the bottom most rind. Probably, if you go up a little bit, it doesn't change that much. Normalized temperature, this is one. It goes from, and this is like 0.5. Well, yeah, so it's, <laughs> yeah, this is not the core mantle boundary temperature. This is the temperature of the, the convecting material in the bottom shell. Yeah, Matt? I'm not going to go there. Uh, well, this is just that. And in the black and white, sort of emphasize that for different studies. I mean, they move around a little bit. Well, the black lines. So, why would it be $100 million? And have you designed a study, a seismic array, in your opinion, the most crystal clear image of the LSVT, the finest boundary? And where would you put the array? How would you design it? So, the question is given $100 million, or what did you say? Hundred million? million? Yeah, because that's not enough. <laughs> really, it's not enough. Because to do to do this right, we need ocean bottom seismometers and dense arrays. A hundred million, yeah, we could do this array of array idea that Adam talked about, but we really need to hit the ocean floor. So I need like I'm thinking like three billion. <laughs> and then then I would blanket the ocean floor. I would I would, have, I would have a workshop. That's what we do when there's lots of money. And uh, say, or even when you don't. And I, and, I, and I would have you come to the workshop, Matt, and I would say, if you had a choice, is there a part of the South Pacific compared to the Atlantic that matters more to the type of data you guys are getting from OIBs or MORBs or whatever? Because it could be that, because it, it all boils down to what volume of Earth you illuminate with seismic energy. It could be that I can't touch the base of the mantle directly beneath Hawaii with much new, unless we test nuclear bombs between Hawaii and Alaska to make the energy to go hit that thing. But it could be that there's several areas on Earth that we could sample very well if we just put an array there. We'll take the $100 million and we'll take it in the field. There you go. I like it. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think you get the same thing. I mean, that's... What's that? You can't do what? Yeah, so Barbara is noting that you can't get this kind of scale with VP because there's not enough sampling. VP is tough. We're not like throwing in the towel. I mean, many of us are very concerned about it because there's a, a rich information. I'm going to, we can, we can stay on this topic, but I, I want to uh, kind of engage uh, dialogue, maybe not in the next 30 minutes, but uh, about different proposed dynamical structures that all 
I mean, in different ways relate to the observation. And my observation I'm referring to is we have large low shear velocity provinces, apparently uh, distinct edges to them. And uh, so they might be chemically distinct, consistent with geodynamic uh, calculations. So one of them is, OK, these are stable piles. What do I mean by stable? I'm not saying the age of the Earth, uh, I, you know, saying on the order of uh, 100 million years, maybe more, maybe primordial, don't know. Another one, so it's just hanging out. The morphology of this thing is determined by the downwellings, and you have these little cusps, ridges, where plumes come off there, and that's where you'll uh, uh, presumably see things squirting out. You may have a, uh, a metastable thing that kind of goes up and down, and sort of hangs out, whether or not that can last a long time or not, don't know. Or you could have things break away, and these have been called uh, super plumes. And uh, so this thing, uh, you know, this chemistry can go up. And so you have some, some things to consider. For these different models, where do you have plumes and hotspots relative to the LSBT material? What's the vertical extent? So all the seismology I told you is imaging, basically, bottom couple hundred kilometers of the mantle is where you have this uh, sharp change. How high do these things go up? Now, there's been some travel time studies that suggest these things go up, you know, 1,000 kilometers in some cases. Uh, that I submit to you there's large uncertainties regarding the vertical extents using travel times alone. Now, if you have a super plume, this is an important one. Uh, we, that's interesting because if it goes up, it has to come down. And how, that's, to me, that, uh, that's uh, kind of cool. What kind of material can you blob up and engage in the convective cycle and go back down without, so you're not, you're not mixing in some sense, because you need to make it later. Because here we are, four and a half billion years into Earth's history, and we're looking at some things now down there. So if there are super plumes, if this is part of our, our cycle, we, we keep remaking these things. So how, how does that happen? Uh, so how do, how do we do better? I guess uh, each of these guys have different edges. Uh, you know, the morphology of these edges, we've not gone in great detail here of, you know, what is the tilt of this? Because I think this is really important if we seismologists can uh, really constrain that because that is going to give us information about the viscosity contrast and the density contrast between these two things. Is it vertical is that way? This would have, you know, that would look like that, but perhaps closer together. But this would keep going up. Wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily see a top to it down here. You might see it way up there. So there's a lot of questions regarding these LSUPs. I want to answer all these questions today. And some of them aren't answered yet in our community. But we'd like to know more about the morphology, not just the basal arrangement of it, the origin of it, many things have been proposed. I'll briefly mention that. What's its relationship to the core mantle boundary and ultra-low velocity zones and slabs and plumes? So uh, briefly, I will uh, show you how, how we're hitting this problem. We're using S-waves because S-waves bottom higher up into the mantle. And uh, so this lets us, in some spots, look in detail uh, to see, like, OK, if I'm, if I'm bottoming in the mantle hundreds of kilometers above the CMB, do I see anything interesting? So what we're going to do is, like, for example, uh, for this Fiji Tonga earthquake recorded at US Ray, this is yeah, 2007, all the stations were over here. I'm color coding the bottom 100 kilometers of the path. And so we're going to be looking at the northeast part of the Pacific LLSVP data look like this when you align them on the S-wave. This is just basically trying to convince you there are a lot of data. And the approach we took is we say, OK, let's, there's so many data, we can get a really good idea of the shape of the S-wave for this earthquake. You can sum it, and you get some kind of a shape. And you could, uh, you know, how are, how's the deviation around the shape? So you could use this thing now to go record by record 
and, and look at data and say, you know, have you become fat because you, you know, some of you went above and some of you guys went into a mark, you know, it's almost like looking at this edge detection trying to find a wall, but turn it on its side to see, can I, we're kind of hunting, can I find the top of an LLSVP doing this? It turns out that many of the data, this is for the earthquake I just showed you, Here's the final sum. We use the narrowest half of the population to define a sum, and then we look for weird waveforms. And some 10% of the data have broadened waveforms that can't be explained by the earthquake. It has to be structure somewhere. These data, these are displacement data that have been source deconvolved, uh, instrument deconvolved, and they've been filtered between one hertz and 100 seconds. So no other filtering. Are they source deconvolved? No, they're not source deconvolved. Those are seismological details I'd be happy to explain to the non-seismologists. When you do this and you take these guys and you say, wow, okay, that guy's really fat. I could, do, I could define an ad hoc, how fat are you? Thing, and we call it misfit. So it's simple. I take this guy, which I say, okay, this is what normal data look like. I'm going to essentially align it, normalize it, and see uh, how much extra area under the curve there is compared to this. And you could decide, you could define a percent like area under the curve sort of thing, and then put that on a map. And this is a, my busiest, second busiest slide. Uh, which I have depth slices. So what we do is we take the bottom 100 kilometers of those S waves and say, I'm going to attribute to you broadening. And these data, this is an area of the Earth beneath uh, Hawaii that these data sample. This is 300 kilometers above the CMB, 400 all the way up to 900. You can see there's some uh, linear kind of looking trends here, that's because my waves are going this way. So if I attribute some uh, broadening to different paths, uh, you'll ha see some streaking in this direction. This whole volume is pretty well sampled through here. So my point is, we don't see the waveform broadening everywhere in these different depth slices. And what these things are plotted on top of here is uh, those lateral gradients in tomography. So if you like are in the back of the room and you squint your eyes, you might say, ah, there's some red there, red there, red there, red there, red there, and then it kind of goes away in the tomography. And then if you look at our work, which are these triangles, big triangles mean super fat waves. You kind of see something similar. You have these things getting closer, and then perhaps there's a top. Uh, you have to get a little creative. So I'm going to show you a cross-section through it. This is uh, the location of the, here's the Hawaiian hotspot surface location. These are just different studies, and uh, Barbara demonstrated the other day, these may not be well constrained at all in the lower mantle because they have downward streaking of where plumes have been uh, argued to be in the, at different depths in the mantle. So my point is, well, these may not be well resolved, but uh, that's, you know, just keep that in mind as we go along. If we do a cross section in this direction, here's now this is a, in, for this cross section bottom, uh, this many kilometers. Here's the LLSVP shape in tomography, and these dark regions are where we have wave for broadening, uh, piercing through the, when it's mapped to this cross section. Now there's a lot. Remember I talked about smearing. I can't actually tell you that this spot right here smeared the waves versus if I follow the ray path up, it might be a volume right here, or it might be, you know. So, but we're just putting it here. So this is crude first order. And the point of this study is to say, well, if you, uh, if you allow yourself to entertain the geodynamic suggestion of large uh, thermochemical piles, so this is a geodynamical calculation, uh, we expect to see edges around this thing, and that's, uh, in principle, that's uh, the spirit of this kind of thing is, you know, maybe we can be approaching that type of imaging, and so just 
a little provocative and to really uh, overdo being provocative. This is the, uh, the compare to many things aspect of this study. This is our study here where we see these, uh, this uh, waveform broadening that seems to be getting, you know, almost shaping maybe a pyramid with some extension. And that looks like these uh, geodynamic piles. This is chemistry. This is a thermal plume for this calculation. In the upper mantle, above, directly above this is where uh, we found uh, the 660 up warp, the 410 down warp with uh, seismology suggesting consistent with the thermal plume. This part is from Wolf et al. This is the streaked out Montelli and this is uh, the LLSVP isoconsort to look exactly like this, Bill. So, uh, I can just tell from the sound of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just revealed. I got to move somewhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and I have a question about those broad waveforms. So, a lot of times we see waveforms rising from deeper depths. So, if you have like a uh, sedimentary basin or something like that, you can get um, broad. So, how do you know that the broadening doesn't have to do with some systematic pattern? Okay, the question is, how do we rule out, I mean, more generally, anywhere along the path? You, could also, you can also appeal to the earthquake source because I'm a subduction zone earthquake and some small cone of energy gets trapped in the former crust and does some stuff. To, we haven't formally gone through to show how the stations uh, in this study can't do it, but the way we do it is to use a lot of earthquakes. In this particular case, they're up and down the Fiji Tonga Trench over to Vanuatu. And so these things are kind of crisscrossing mildly this structure. If it were just some clump of stations that, you know, some, something under North America, then there would be two effects. You would see every seismic wave broadened there and you would smear the thing out that you downward project. So we're pretty sure that's not what's going on here. Yes? It's, it's broadened because uh, our interpretation of it and some uh, 3D wave field experiments have demonstrated it that if I'm propagating to you and Jonathan is the anomaly. Uh, one wave goes around him. One wave hits him. He's low velocity, delays. And so here it's a complete waveform. It heals behind him, and then you end up with two pulses. Like multi it's, multi it's precisely multipathing. You can almost view it as uh, you know, a layer over a half space in the horizontal sense. You have two layers, one that goes in the other medium, one that stays and refracts. You? Yes? This. No. Uh, there's a couple things. As you get lower and lower and lower in S wave to the CMB, you start getting in the business of the core reflection, which is SCS. And so if SCS starts getting in the window of our experiment, we will interpret that as waveform broadening. And so, however, this thing does extend up off the CMB. And so it could be uh, internal structure to the large low shear velocity province. In fact, we've, we've done a local tomography experiment, and there's a lot of internal structure to the LLSVP. It could be scattering off of something inside the LLSVP. We don't constrain what it is, but it's real. Those waves are broadened. So re regarding the uh, internal structure, this is uh, a geodynamics uh, slice, and here is typically what we show, but if I just take what's inside the yellow line and plot it with a different color scale, here I'm emphasizing uh, internal temperature now of a geodynamically predicted pile. And so this gets even more interesting if you have, uh, if you're bringing things like uh, 
former oceanic crust down here in Ming Ming Li with Alan McNamara showing how that stuff can go up and then fall in here and so you can end up with lots of heterogeneity. So and the hottest temperature in these uh, types of calculations are typically at their margins here. And that's what this is attempting. This, this is supposed to be the CMB coming out of the board. And here uh, I've contoured 0.98 in the 0 to 1. And so just to show that the hottest temperatures are along the margin. And they go through cells internally. So regarding ultra-low velocity zones, if ultra-low velocity zones are related to temperature, as in partial melt of something special or partial melt of LLSVP, we expect it to be where the highest temperatures are. And that's where one should look. For this particular calculation, the density is depending on, I mean, the intrinsic density, it's almost neutrally buoyant. And uh, Maxim mentioned this the other day. But the intrinsic density is between 2 and 5% higher than this stuff. OK. Uh, I'll try to get myself out of this mess. Dun, dun, dun. Well, yeah. Uh, this morphology is an interesting one. It's been seen in tank experiments. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a movie, which uh, I shouldn't because it's not my movie. But it's a three chemistry movie. And hopefully, uh, I really like it because it uh, emphasizes the type of possibilities that one may have in a system where there are cold downwellings. This is a high resolution 2D calculation. So there's three chemistries in this, uh, in this movie. And uh, there's the ambient mantle. Uh, there's the large low shear velocity thermochemical pile material. And this movie also has a, a thin rind, which you can't quite make out here, but it's ultra-low velocity zones. And in this movie, we'll see uh, this top panel is chemistry. So here's the large low shear velocity, these piles. This red stuff in this chemistry pane is ultra-low velocity zones. And the black stuff is mantle. And so down here is the temperature map. You'll see how slabs will viscously push this stuff around. And every now and then, the way these things uh, get pushed around, you can get large sort of that one was quelled by this former slab. But you can get these sort of burpy, episodic entrainment. Boom, there goes one. And you can see the material goes up. I, I guess this one's been leaking all along. I wasn't looking. Uh, and actually, Curtis Williams, is, is uh, he's kind of done science of how much of this material goes up. And he's maybe, did you do this on a poster, Curtis? Yes. Yeah, OK, so maybe you saw that. But anyway. It's interesting, because could you put stuff in here? And this kind of gets back to the volume question. How big is it? Uh, I don't know that that's extremely well constrained. You can take tomography today and say, I'm just going to define volume by some assuming an isocontour in tomography. Now, how much of this stuff can I have reservoirs in here? Let me keep it going, because you all get this glazed look over your face. Can I have these reservoirs where there is crosstalk, where, OK, this stuff is clearly mixing. It clearly feeds the upper mantle. I mean, it feeds the mantle. How much of it goes up to a place where you might actually see it get erupted? Because you can see a lot of it goes up. And then the currents cause something to change or because subduction patterns change. This is 4 billion years uh, equivalent of a calculation, apparently, Alan tells me. But there's a lot of, if you can stash your uh, you know, things that you never want to get out, I guess the hidden reservoirs, is that like Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns? Or those are known unknowns. Uh, you can, uh, you know, you have diff maybe you, you can argue, and I, I would accept it, that, hey, you know, adding a uh, another chemistry, ultra-low velocity zones, like a free parameter. And that's not fair, because ultra-low velocity zones might be partially molten. This stuff, don't know. But anyway, this is just a provocative movie. I encourage us to discuss it in terms of our different uh, fields.
That's right. In those movies, the cold down wellings are the they are the viscous pile shaping forces. That is a natural consequence of the of, of the calculation. There's no no rules have been made. You start with an initially uniform layer, you let it go, and that's just for the well. Yeah, and actually this this has been very humbling for me, a guy who started making cartoons about a decade ago, right? Uh, I draw and then boom, that's my picture. But no, I mean, you watch any one of these guys, and I guess the go, th those of you in the room that do these calculations would tell me, like, no, it, it's, uh, you could just keep tracking it. The former subducted material will follow any, I mean, this is viscous flow. And so your, your wiggle room is what viscosity laws are you going to choose, and what sort of densities are you going to ascribe to your reservoirs in, in, in the, and do the reservoirs have a different viscosity law? I mean, you, this is tough because sometimes in a calculation you can't have the orders of magnitude of viscosity that you would like because of the you know, smaller time steps and the resolution of the calculation. But there's a lot. I mean, every time I still haven't, and this is just one, there's like dozens of these calculations with tweaked parameters. And now Ming Ming is kind of doing this with uh, Morb in the fantastic animations, and you should see him and look at him on his laptop. It's, uh, it forces you to uh, sort of reevaluate, at least me, my, my idea of how things work. Is this a cross-section of the 3D model? No, this is 2D only. This is 2D only, which is, uh, has its own issues, because you know this is not truly a plume. That's a sheet. <laughs> and and you also they're missing phase transitions. We're missing compressibility. We're, there's a lot of things it misses that will, in some cases, change the vigor or the number of plumes or the sizes and scales. But I think to first order, the behavior of viscous, dense, cold slabs pushing around layers at the base remains. Yeah, Mac. Yeah, OK, so uh, just for the record, Maxim commented on the Tackler group doing this in 3D, but it's slightly lower resolution because it's a bigger thing. And Nakagawa is kind of carrying this uh, torch. He's doing a lot of work with includes phase transitions and some of these other effects. Can we image the inside structure? Yeah, and, and there, are, there are groups who are trying to do this. We're about to submit something where we image the inside, and it's, it's heterogeneous. So. Okay, so Barbara has made a very good point that in 3D, she's not aware of a one where the piles are stable, in other words. It's this, well, it's the same thing in 2D. These things are moving around. They, they do, actually. I, I deleted a slide where I took uh, snapshots, and you see these things merging and moving. And the point in the 3D models, they move around, but as long as Downwellings are stable, so if you impose surface motion, plate motions, and to first order you have the circumpacific downwellings, the piles, their shapes will change and morph around, but to first order they also have a degree two element. Now we don't have plate motions long enough to really address this, so they move around, so it could very well be 
that even on Earth, in the seismology, now this is kind of a somewhat uh, plain a little bit. This is a, through Ritsuma's model, and, and I picked and rotated and flipped and did whatever I could to make the geodynamics look like it. Uh, but this is a spherical geodynamics calculation. These things will move around, but if you have the downwellings more or less in these regions, like Adam showed this very interesting, provocative, and I think it's the first order right, that you have a ring of downwelling and then degree two warm stuff. These things will, to first order, sort of stay antipodal. But this, you know, you can, you can debate this. It's a good thing for us to debate. Yes? Yes, and another interesting aspect of this is like, let's say in uh, another two or three, four hundred million years, we make our next supercontinent. Uh, Peter Olson mentioned it, SETI, and I don't know how this happens, but he argued that the piles would form one giant pile. So then you would have a degree one pile, and then you have a supercontinent, and then break up and become degree two piles again. I'm just, I haven't seen the evidence for that, but that's interesting. So. They may not stay in this arrangement. So uh, in my remaining moments, I guess, as far as origin, I'm not going to advocate or uh, refute any of these. We have to uh, consider this may have been around for a very long time, or we may be building it through time. I think there is a challenge in, in doing it this way, because especially when you move to uh, kilometers type scale, instead of hundreds, this stuff just kind of entrains. If you make it dense enough, it'll just flatten out. And Ming Ming has movies showing this. This, uh, this model is uh, uh, provocative and, and may provide some uh, way to, to build this thing. I'm not going to uh, advocate any of these. I just my, my main point is, whatever you're going to argue this thing is, whether it's some sort of iron-rich perovskite, or ferropericlase, or uh, ancient uh, magma ocean, or more, whatever. You have to find a way. You have to demonstrate that it's compatible with today's observed morphology from seismology. And then dynamically, it has to be consistent. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'll, I'll stay clear of some of the seismology. Just. Uh, I want to mention that these ultra-low velocity zones, where it's a very tens of kilometers with tens of percent reduction at the CMB, uh, have been imaged in these regions. And just a one point is that in some cases, you know, to distinguish from a normal mantle, we've been talking about fine layering at the above the core mantle boundary, where you may uh, this. You may have some, some uh, possibilities. Now, this is an old slide, and there's been more recent work that talks about how you might have a dynamically induced bump and how that may fill up with stuff, and maybe other ways to end up with structure we seismically see and call ultra-low velocity zones. There, this map is a, a little old now. There's a few more spots on it. Uh, but underneath here is. D double prime tomography, and I, Bill, I just picked this line randomly. But it's uh, outlining uh, the low velocities, kind of inspired to get us to look at uh, ULVZs in relationship to this. The, the inference has been that uh, ultra low velocity zones are at the edges of these things where we don't see them. So red are where they've been detected, blue are where they have been not detected but looked for and everywhere else hasn't been seen. And Sonnet sent me this image. So there's people are making new probes. And here's a region sort of to the north. Now this is using diffracted waves, which is great because this gives us many more regions to study. If I put her spot here, it's right there for another one. 
Maybe I got my size wrong when I just added it. But we can do better to look through, through these different margins. I guess the geodynamics wouldn't have them everywhere. They'd be in spots where they're kind of being swept. Uh, but this is important because we want to know, are these things, uh, are they partially molten LLSBP materials? So they're mostly near the low velocities, uh, near the margins too. They're not always inside them. The properties are consistent with partial melt. If you, uh, you know, the caveats here are you don't always see them. There's some spots in here where they haven't been seen. But then there's a detection threshold that is a, is a bit of an issue. So they're sometimes missing. We often see this ratio between S-velocity drops and P-velocity drops that are on the order of 3 to 1. And that's been used to argue for partial melt. That's not always the case. They're not always ultra low. Sometimes they're dense. Sometimes you see them out here that aren't anywhere near these. So it's not a super clear story. This, this is, I basically said this resolution thing. More seismic probes are needed. What is it? Uh, this list keeps growing. Uh, you know, uh, from magma ocean, I put that twice, uh, so it must be right. Reaction products between the core and the mantle, partial melt of something, whether it's a mantle material, something different from LSVP, uh, relationship between uh, the exotics on the core mantle boundary topography. Actually, I modified this and it disappeared. There's a, the Bauer et al. paper most recently did this. Some uh, way, pardon me? Oh, that's not clear to you? <laughs> Exotics, OK. Uh, this is, yeah, wow. This is where you, uh, something beyond just simple stratification between entities in the mantle. But that's a, a, uh, a dynamical and mineral physics explanation. If I, in the particular case of uh, Rost and Ravenau just imaged something they said was a a little mountain on the core mantle boundary that was filled underneath it with something special. They didn't say how. The Bauer, Wicks, uh, Jackson, I think Dave may have been involved in, in, a, in a study recently, had a depressed CMB by downwelling, and the core material can infiltrate from the side and fill it up. So exotics is sort of like a complex adaptive system. You find a word to say something that's unusual compared to our normal paradigms. Phase trans, maybe all of these are exotic. Uh, phase trans, phase change may, iron may more go into that if that's right. Uh, you know, many things here. So uh, my point is it's not constrained. So I'm, I'm going to sew up uh, and just say that, uh, you know, kind of looking back, we have these, uh, yeah, so these things, uh, this is tomography here in geodynamics. In geodynamics, these things respond to the downwelling currents ultra-low velocity zones seem to migrate to places on the margins <coughs> in these calculations that may be consistent with seismology. More imaging will help. These piles do move around in these calculations, and uh, the ultra-low velocity zones can merge and make giant ultra-low velocity zones. And that's part of my talk I'm just going to skip over in a second. So if you can really image ultra-low velocity zones in detail and large-low shear velocity provinces in detail, you could actually say something about mantle dynamics. So i skip through this. These are my merging ULVZ. Ooh, big one. Then they go to the sides. Skip, 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 skip. Uh, one interesting thing is if you have a, a this is a core mantle boundary image now. With, I didn't put a scale on here. but. Uh, this is where you have these thermochemical piles, from Teresa Lassick's work. On the margins of these piles, you will upwarp the CMB from the viscous currents that shape these things. They go in and they come up. And this is sort of a plateau beneath piles. And so this is something for seismologists to look for. We actually, in the Pacific, we image an area right here for this. And we find evidence using underside reflections top side reflections of an ultra low velocity zone on the margin of a LLSVP and complex, I say complex here, a complex 
CMB topography. We don't actually image a positive bond, but, but we see stuff there. <laughs> a scale. This would be 300 kilometers by 1,000 kilometers. This is a cartoon. This is, yeah, this is it, yeah, a cartoon. This is meant to be kilometers. It's not constrained. Yes? I'm sorry, I meant to say uh, if it's five kilometers or less, nearly all of the seismic probes that look for ultra low velocity zones won't see it. The significance of that is that ultra-low velocity zone material could be ubiquitous. Could be hundreds of meters over here beneath subduction. And then uh, the viscous currents kind of collect it underneath upwelling and it grows up near these, these edges because I have internal circulation. And so it groups there. Where it's, where it's been observed, yes. So, yeah, that's right. Seismic constraints, 10 to 20 kilometers where we observe it. Laterally, depends on the probe. Some studies have detected 100 kilometer-ish sorts of scales. Sanj, I don't know what your scale is. Uh, 500? There you are. 1,000 kilometers in, in width. So, I guess uh, sewing up here, if uh, taking this image from Tackley, and there, there are different images like this. If we want to uh, kind of relate to the geochemistry possibilities of a place where you uh, keep some things for a very long time and never see them versus you tap this and you can see certain things, I think this uh, lower panel here is probably the closest to what I'm advocating. Uh, then again, this is like the figure I draw, boom, dead. But no, it's, there are, there's more circulation here. Exactly the details of what sorts of things we may or may not see, uh, hard, you know, we actually have to talk about that. So this figure was shown before, but basically this idea, and this is not really distinct from the Luis's uh, 1999 cartoon where subduction goes down and modifies this basal layer and plumes can, uh, entrain things from this layer is, is what I think the seismology is consistent with. And better dynamical pictures, uh, this is from uh, Kagawa, uh, exploring the, the types of parameters that include phase changes are really important to distinguish. I think we can rule this out in the base, of the very mixed. And this uh, may be something between these. This might be harder to see a top to it than this, but I think it's a, it's a fun time right now because the imaging is better and there's still a lot that seismology can bring to the table by more detailed imaging and so it's a ripe time to integrate the geochemistry and geodynamics with some of the seismic work. Thank you. So the question, uh, data sets that show LSVP and ULVZ in the same data, yes, I think so. I think uh, there's a couple regions that are pretty well sampled and that, that's uh, in this part of the Pacific because you have a lot of earthquakes down here. And at this particular point in time, you have a lot of sensors right there. So the same data that will give rise to extra arrivals for ultra low velocity zones have been delayed and multi path from LLSVPs. Coffee? Bill? So back to the volume issue. So why would a seismologist say, when I say, oh, the volume is 10%, uh, not 2%, why would a seismologist get fussed about knowing that volume if we can be so cavalier as to pick the velocity contrast? Give me more detail. The question is, why would a seismologist be fussy about 
Bill's uh, advocating a specific volume. Uh, Did I fact, get upset? Yeah, that, uh, no, 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 you didn't get upset. But and in fact, I'm trying to test hypothesis space. And, and so I, I know that the favorite is, you know, one, two, three percent of the deep man bill is LLSVP. Okay? So I said, really? Oh, well, that's what I've often heard. Okay? The volumes described by this. And I said, well, why not go to 10%? Because actually, you know, if I have a two color man bill, one is more source and one is OIP source, what would be, you know, the penalty if I assign the two LLSVPs being OIBs, Ocean Island Basalt Source Regions, and they represented 10% of the man and uh, that represented a certain uh, delta BX. And, and so I got a sense that maybe we should be going to that level of delta BX. Okay, so Bill's question is, uh, you know, if seismologists advocate, for example, 2% of large low sea velocity provinces, why can't we take 10? I would, I would take that question and say, okay, let's take 10. I, can, I could just take the axis of tomography away and then just find, you know, find the value which gives you that volume. And then the question I would have to turn that to the mineral physicist, meet geodynamicist to say, how can you keep something with chemical distinction of this volume not manifesting in the velocities? Because you always have the temperature and chemical contribution to a velocity. So it could very well be that you might be able to comfortably live in the uncertainty space with that volume, but the seismology just won't be very red. Or you appeal to our reference model mindset being wrong. Right, so where, where I'm coming from, I go to test where I assume that uh, one silicator at home, another silicator at home, and another silicator at home that represents the uh, conservation of atoms I have cast my system. Then I assign continental crust, okay, and then I have two unknowns, basically, which is the concentration of elements in the two mantle reservoirs, more than one, and the volume of those two reservoirs. And if I make the OIB reservoir one or two percent by volume, I have to really give it lots of storage in uranium, okay? And so then I want to say, can I relax that so I can make my OIB volume larger and not have it so intense in terms of heat production? So that's why I'm asking that question. Yeah, I understand that. And uh, I guess the thing I loosely say to uh, you guys is uh, what if there is a volume of melt? Can you change your volume requirement because you can stick much more of it into a melt than in the solid LLSVP? And I say, if I can do that, sure, but what is Luis going to say? I don't know, let's ask her. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... Mathematically, we can do what we want. Not entirely. I mean, you can't put... If you make a layer, if you make something so small, right, it's going to get to the end of other problems. Right. Okay. But, but I don't think these... You can draw the contour line in some sensible place. You know, there's some range at which it's no longer sensible to draw them. Right. But, um, but it, I think it would be very hard to put uncertainties on what that is. Using the gradients makes sense to me. Yeah, and so that's, that's right. So Luis, Luis's point is the subjectivity in drawing that my orange line here or my isocontour line might be mitigated a little bit by looking at the gradients. You have some wiggle room. Like, where should my grade, start of the gradient, the middle of the gradient? Formal statistical approach, for example. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I I can imagine in some cases it might be possible in places where tomography doesn't constrain things really well, but that'd be a little ad hoc. Right. Matt. Okay, so Matt's advocating we adopt the gradient as the LLSVP boundary. The one caveat there 
In 3D. Yeah, the, the one caveat is uh, vertically, uh, different seismic models are, are parameterized in the vertical direction differently, sometimes with blinds, sometimes with block shells. And so I think you're going to do better laterally than vertically. And so that's something for us to have the tomographers help us to understand what volumes of the Earth are better resolved than others to do this experiment. But that's that's what I just said. It's the height thing, which I'm saying. Yes, Vernon. Uh, it's well known in tomography uh, with Dan's inversion that the percent perturbation is the action rate much larger. Uh, in, uh, in In, in our imaging, we are just detecting where it's happening. We haven't modeled it yet. Uh, those who have modeled it have made, you know, yeah, I'd say it's sometimes it's a little arbitrary, but they double it or, you know, so 4% instead of 2.5% or 3% instead of 1.5%. So I want to get to Mark here. Yeah. This was a seismology talk with a little bit of geodynamics, so geodynamics question, even though I don't think the models you showed really will address my question, but I want to raise it anyway. Right? If these if these LLSVPs are ancient, then that's saying something about the mass flux in and out of them. Right? If if we had models where we understood how, how they were losing and gaining mass with time, we would know whether or not they can retain their identity from one half to eight years or one half to or not much larger. So, so Mark's question is about the longevity of a primordial pile. You can make them last, no problem. You you could play you could play viscosity games so the entrainment isn't great, but the way you get around it is you start with a bigger pile. So, uh, the calculation I showed it was 2D, yeah, and so that to begin with. Yeah, okay, so that's an important constraint to bring to the table, to say to the geodynamicist, wait a minute, your pile can't be a third of the lower mantle, and here's why. So that's something you need to say. Did you just say it? No, I Okay, yeah, Barbara. I see. percent VS contour, so an amount you get 7.3% mantle volume. Mm. So there's basically some trade-offs as to what contour yes. you take. I see. But it gives you some idea. I see. Of the volume. So four years ago, CIDR slides on the on the web. This is cool. Uh, this experiment of uh, volume of these super swells. They were that was the word du jour back then to a uh, minimum VS anomaly of what you contour. That's a provocative slide. Okay, let's break for coffee. Thank you.